couple of weeks ago on this program, we told you about how the honeybee population in the United States has been in steep decline over the past few years and what the very real consequences of this could be for our food supply. But now there may be even more reason to save the bees. Scientists have found that when it comes to making important decisions, like where to build a new hive, bee colonies go through a democratic process, much like our own model of American democracy. Each group of bees lobbies the rest of the colony. I don't know if lobbies is the word I'd use, <laughs> for the site they think is most suitable for the new hive. And then the new location is chosen based on a vote. Joining me now to explain this phenomenon is Tom Seeley, professor of the, in, the, uh, in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at Cornell University and author of the book, Honey Bee Democracy. Dr. Seeley, welcome to the program. My pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. Bees vote? Yes, they do. They vote by, uh, they vote what, with their wings. The uh, bees that like one home site rather than another will vi spend time at that home site and the way they will come back and they'll bring their sisters to that home site. And the competition is one to see which site will build up uh, sufficient popularity first. Well, that's very interesting. So uh, what about the role of the queen in all this? Well, that's, that's a great question. And the reason I called my book Honey Bee Democracy is because the power of this situation or this decision making is vested not in the queen, her majesty, but in all of the, but in the workers. And uh, so that's why the, uh, so the queen does not play a role. Are there other examples of democracy and bee behavior? Oh yes, virtually every decision that is made in a honeybee colony is made by the workers. <laughs> the queen, despite her name, is, is really just an egg-laying uh, uh, machine. And so decisions like where the foragers should go each day to collect food, whether to build more combs, to ho hold more honey, all of those things are decisions that are made democratically uh, or collectively by the worker bees. To the best of your knowledge, uh, I mean, there was a famous piece, and actually I wrote about it in two of my my books. Um, a couple of years ago in Nature, uh, there was a study done in, in the UK on red deer, and they, they found something similar. And, and uh, you know, that, that, that DNA, that our DNA, that democracy essentially is in our DNA. Do you, in your research, have you seen this extend to other insects or other animals? I see it extend to, um, yes, it, it occurs in many, many animals. Wherever you have a situation where the information that needs to be used in the decision isn't concentrated in one well-informed leading animal. Um, you have usually a, the decision-making spread among a number of animals. The, you referred to the red deer. Um, they were deciding when to, when to move and where to move to. Right. And that's a decision that reflects uh, all of the members of the herd, really. Right, it was not the alpha, alpha animal. So one of the debates that, that we've had in human society for a long, long time, and we're having right now in the United States, is, as, as Michael Moore famously said in Sicko, there was a moment in that movie where he kind of turned to the camera and he said, we have to decide at some point, I'm paraphrasing from memory, but I think this is about it. He said, we have to decide at some point, are we gonna be a we society or a me society? Are there, you know, clearly the bees are a we society. Are there any other examples of a me society out there in the animal kingdom or, or are those who say that humans are unique and we should just be a me society? Do they, do they have it totally wrong biologically? Well, it, it all depends on the situation. If you've got a situation where you have a group of animals, be it humans or non-human animals, and their interests, um, they're working together as a group, so their fate is combined, um, then it really makes sense to have input from all of the individuals. No, it's very rare that one individual in a group um, has a monopoly on the information or is particularly well informed. And so you really, many, many times, it's good to spread out the decision making among individuals. You see that all the time in, um, that's why we have nine mem members of the Supreme Court. Uh, it's why we have our elections. You see it on game shows when, you, when, you, when they turn the, the question over to the audience. Um, so there are many, many cases where a we, a we approach or a wisdom of the crowd approach is, is really quite powerful and appropriate. Remarkable. Dr. Tom Seeley, thanks so much for being with us and sharing your story. My pleasure. The fact that a honeybee colony can depict 
advanced behavior like the principles of advanced excuse me behavior like the principles of democracy it's pretty staggering on its own perhaps the bigger question is what this discovery tells us about our own human history and the evolution of democracy in our society here's it, this is this has been a debate throughout human history through at least western civilization actually i'd say among aboriginal and indigenous people it was never a debate or maybe it was 50,000 or 100,000 years ago but they figured it out but as civilized people we've been deba debating this for some time here in the united states you know the, the earliest debate is democracy a natural thing or are those nations or people who decide to behave democratically pushing themselves out of the realm of natural behavior and and going into you know some very abnormal behavior this was one of the real debates at the beginning of, the, of our country the, the 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 primary european paradigm was that kingdoms and theocracies were absolutely necessary to govern people because they're inherently evil and you have to have strong leaders essentially an anti-democratic you know thought process or, or meme and this is the big debate about the enlightenment you know thomas hobbes first said oh, people might be able to govern themselves john locke in his second treatise on government and this was all you know all the 1600 the 17th century jean-jacques rousseau all this then carried over to the founding fathers Jefferson said, enlighten the people generally, and tyranny and oppressions of body and mind will vanish like spirits at the dawn of day. He believed in the crowd theory that the, that the professor was just telling us about. On the other hand, conservatives of the day, like President John Adams, had a very different story to tell about that. He talked about the multitude, the vulgar, the herd, the rabble, the mob, and passed the Alien and Sedition Acts and threw 20, 20 newspaper editors in prison. Because they, you know, one of them, uh, Ben Franklin's grandson, Benjamin Franklin Bach, said that Adams, President Adams, is old, toothless, querulous, and balding. He put him in prison for that. This has been the, the, the debate between conservatives and liberals for centuries. Are we inherently democratic, small d democratic, or should we have kings, or queens, or lords, or popes, or whatever? And it sure seems to me like the, the, the B story nails it. Democracy is in our genes. It's in our DNA.